Let us pray. Father, we praise you for the world you have made. We thank you for the beauty of your creation that surrounds us and inspires us, sometimes terrifies us. But we thank you that you are Lord of earth and sky and that you are in control of all things. Help us to understand these truths in our day and age. Help us to understand how these things inspire our lives and guide our lives. We pray that we'd understand your word more fully and completely now. And may my words be your words as we seek to learn and grow together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our series of messages on living the proof continues today. But today we are talking about the holiday that is today known as Earth Day. Now it is a recent addition to our American holidays, officially begun around 1970. And the whole point of Earth Day is the preservation of our planet. Now that's a good idea. One that actually goes back to the book of Genesis when God gave dominion of the earth to mankind. And when he charged Adam and Eve to tend and care for the garden. But as a holiday, Earth Day's roots aren't biblical in the sense of how it has been developed and celebrated today. See, those who first proposed Earth Day were enamored with the planet and sought to be in harmony with the natural order. In fact, the title of our message today, Mother Nature Question Mark, ties in with all of this. You've heard that term, oh, Mother Nature won't allow it, or Mother Nature does this, or Mother Nature does that. But most people don't understand where this concept came from. This mythical idea of Mother Nature is that the planet is somehow our mother, nurturing and caring for us. But the truth of the matter is that concept goes back to ancient Greek paganism, where the Greeks worshipped Gaia, the goddess of Mother Earth. The idea of Mother Nature isn't found anywhere in Judaism or Christianity. Now, the modern founders of Earth Day weren't connected to Judaism or Christianity either. Many were atheists and socialists. Let's just walk you through that briefly so we understand, and then we'll get into what Scripture has to say about it. In 1962, Rachel Carson published her book, The Silent Spring, where she warned of the dangers of using pesticides, especially one that was commonly in use back then known as DDT. She is one of the early pioneers of the modern environmentalist movement, and her work was largely responsible for the outlawing of DDT pesticide throughout the world. But since then, her scientific claims have been largely debunked as false. Sadly, that was too late for millions of people who died in third world countries from malaria. Many that might have survived if the cheap and effective pesticide DDT could have been used to destroy malaria carrying mosquitoes. In 1968, Stanford University professor Paul Ehrlich published his book, The Population Bomb, where he predicted the mass starvation of humanity by the 1980s if we didn't reduce the world's population. Oh, the world cannot sustain the number of people we have, Ehrlich argued. His work grew in part into part of the environmentalist movement that erroneously argued that the earth couldn't sustain the growing population with food. And we know, of course, there wasn't mass starvation throughout the planet in the 1980s or since. 
In 2006, former Vice President Al Gore produced and starred in the film An Inconvenient Truth, where he predicted the melting of the polar ice caps and the flooding of coastal cities worldwide due to global warming. In fact, he actually stated that New York City would be underwater by the year 2014. But Gore's alarmed, ba alarms, based on erroneous climate-predicting computer models, have proven to be false. And as a result, the global warming movement quickly changed its name to the climate change movement, when the actual data have shown that there have been no significant global temperature increases in the past 20 years. Not the models, but the actual data. But the Save the Planet movements continue to be strong today, and Earth Day is a major holiday for these folks. So what should the response of the Christian Church be to all of this? Do we repudiate it? Do we endorse it? How do we respond? First of all, let's take the words of both the psalmist and later the Apostle Paul, where the psalmist states, and Paul quotes it in another passage, The earth is the Lord's, and all it contains. Psalm 24, 1 and 1 Corinthians 10, 26. See, we believe it's God's creation given to mankind to control and to care for. Our passage today, the first one, comes from Job chapter 12, and that gives us more detail about that. Job 12, 7 through 15, we begin in verse 7. He says, But now ask the beasts, and let them teach you, and the birds of the heavens, and let them tell you, Or speak to the earth, and let it teach you. And let the fish of the sea declare to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In whose hand is the life of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind? See, Job is proclaiming, look, God has made an amazing world in which we live. And if we seek to be in harmony with nature, we must be connected to the creator of it all. Job goes on to explain further. Verse 11. Does not the ear test words as the palate tastes its food? Wisdom is with aged men, with long life is understanding. And then Job connects that to God, of course, where he says in verse 13, With him, God, are wisdom and might. To him belong counsel and understanding. See, when we're connected with God, Job is saying, we have his wisdom about things. He is in control of all things in nature, including us, mankind. He goes on to explain this. Behold, he tears down and it cannot be rebuilt. He imprisons a man and there can be no release. Behold, he restrains the waters and they dry up, and he sends them out and they inundate the earth. See, it's actually arrogant folly for mankind to think we can really control nature and the world around us. That somehow we would have the power to completely destroy God's creation or to completely fix the problems within it. See, despite all of our technology and all of our wealth, we can't stop natural disasters. We still live in a world with earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes and blizzards. And those have been going on 
for thousands of years. We can make all the predictions we want, and it won't change a thing about the weather. Just look at this prolonged winter we have been enduring this year. Global warming? Cut me a break. It's April 22nd. It was 25 degrees at my house this morning when I woke up. You know, it reminds me of a story from some months back about this expedition of global warming scientists who are going to study in Antarctica, and their ship got stuck in the sea ice because there was so much of it. So much for the melting ice caps. Now, does this mean we shouldn't care about the planet? Of course not. We should be good stewards of God's abundance all around us. But being a steward doesn't mean worshiping the planet. It doesn't mean not using the resources God has placed here for us to use. It doesn't mean not improving our technology to make things more abundant and cheaper for the masses. There's quite a bit of misinformation out there. But if we think things through, we can see the common sense truth. We can have that wisdom that Job proclaims comes with age when you're connected to God. Let's talk about this for a few examples. People have decried, oh, you shouldn't cut down any trees. Because we need the oxygen that they produce to keep us healthy. But if you look at it, trees are actually a crop. It's just their growing cycle is longer than, say, a wheat crop or a corn crop. And let's think about this. A live Christmas tree is actually far more environmentally friendly than an artificial one. Because it grows for a number of years, it puts out the oxygen, it gets cut down, you use it in your home. When you're done with it, you compost it or put it out where it will decay and put its nutrients back into the soil. An artificial one's made out of plastic of various kinds. It's produced as a byproduct of petroleum. It takes a lot of energy and some pollution to create it. And when you're done with it, you throw it in a landfill and it sits there for a couple hundred years till the plastic breaks down. So I ask you, which is better for the environment? Now, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty if you have artificial Christmas trees. I'm just saying this is the truth. There are more trees in America today when the pilgrims came. Well, how can that be? Well, the lumber industry reseeds forests when they cut it. Why wouldn't they? They want to have a future business if they just cut down all the trees and say, oh well, there's nothing left for us to cut. We'll just go out of business. That would be silly. No, every legitimate lumber producer replants after they cut. I saw a documentary one time about a tree farm somewhere out in the West. 100,000 acres it was. All of planted trees. And every day they cut down five acres of trees. And then the next day they move on to another five acre plot and another five acre plot. And behind them comes the planters to replant those. And they can work their way all around their plots in the course of, say, 20 years. And everything resustains itself. It provides lumber for building and homes and furniture. Provides homes for critters for 20 years till they get cut down. And it's resustaining because of human efforts. The other reason that there are more trees today than when the pilgrims came is we can stop forest fires somewhat today. Not totally. But we have the ability to do things like fire breaks and put water on them and send airplanes and helicopters with chemicals to put fires out. Back in the 1600s when the pilgrims came, if there was a lightning strike that started a fire, it would continue to burn until the rains came again. And there's evidence of thousands of acre devastations with forest fires before there was technology to battle them. 
Our food production capabilities today are greater than ever before in human history. We are growing more food in less space today than ever before. The crop yields that farmers are seeing today are unheard of compared to previous generations. The world record for growing corn is over 500 bushels in an acre. That is a 100-fold increase in just the last 75 years on the same soils. The truth of the matter is that any hunger left in the world today has far more to do with lousy, oppressive governments denying food to their own people than for any lack of resources available. Places where people once faced starvation are now filled with food. Thanks to the efforts of a, an American scientist a few decades ago who developed a new form of wheat, people in India are no longer starving. But the wheat that he produced for them grows perfectly in their climates and it's abundant. And they have more food now than ever, even though they have more people now than ever. And the chief reason for poverty in third world countries? It isn't lack of food, it isn't ongoing wars. It's a lack of cheap, dependable energy. A lack of electricity and gasoline and natural gas to have the quality of life we experience here. Because they haven't developed it or they haven't the infrastructure to make it possible. Now, after saying all that, we still understand that there are problems with the world. Yes, we have had a problem with pollution. Far less today than we did even 30 years ago. Yes, we've had some deforestation. Some of these companies in South America did cut the rainforest because they were looking for quick, cheap lumber or looking to build farmland. And yes, we've seen species go extinct. Some through our own neglect, some through just the natural entropy of this world, just like many of the species in the fossil record are now extinct. But some of that has nothing to do with human use. It has to do with human sin. Now, Paul explains this to us in the next passage we have in the message this morning, Romans 8, 18 to 25. Paul says here, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. We always need to remember that suffering in the world is not what God originally intended, nor is it what He plans for the future. Because of human sin, the world is fallen, flawed, and often filled with tragedy. But he goes on to explain. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption in the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. You see, we live in a groaning creation because it isn't how God originally made it. In the beginning, God pronounced His creation as very good. But sin brought death, brought disease, brought pain, and brought suffering, even to the natural world. We do see it all around us 
in nature. Predators eat prey. Animals suffer defects and diseases. Natural disasters claim many lives. But we wait in hope for something better. Paul continues. And not only this, but we also ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. And I guess the older you get, the more you tend to groan, right? <laughs> it's just a natural part of living in a fallen world. And he goes on, though. He says, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. So Paul is saying, yes, if you look around the world, there's trouble. If you look around nature, there are problems. Things get out of control. Things are not what they could be. Things aren't perfect. But that's not how it's going to be. Because God has a plan. He's saying, look, we eagerly wait for God to fulfill His promises to us. To transform us and the world around us to a perfect state. For when Jesus returns, all will be put right. All of the pain and the sorrow of the past will be no more. We won't have to worry about praying for people who are sick anymore. We won't have to pray for people who are dealing with natural disasters anymore. We won't have to pray for families who've lost loved ones anymore. Because all of these present things will be done and over. Replaced with perfection. So what is the proof that we have that we live in hope? that all of this will come to pass. That the tragedies we see in the world aren't permanent. Well, as our series points out, it was the proof of Jesus' resurrection from the dead on Easter. That's the ultimate proof. See, this was the first step to reversing the effects of the curse. Jesus conquering death. And what lies ahead, he promises us, will be amazing. You thought I was exaggerating, joking with these kids about the idea of having an elephant or a dinosaur or a lion for a pet. Uh-uh. Imagine a little girl being able to cuddle up next to a 500-pound tiger without any fear of getting eaten. Or imagine a little boy climbing on the back of a several ton elephant and riding him around all day just like he's a bicycle. That's the kind of stuff that will happen even though it can't now. But this is what God has promised us. And probably so much more we can't even begin to grasp it. So getting back to Earth Day, we can and we should celebrate Earth Day in the knowledge, as that hymn says, this is my Father's world. We can rejoice that He has given us the resources and the wisdom to develop them to improve life on this fallen world. I mean, imagine how somebody could be led to look at moldy bread and turn it into an amazing medicine, penicillin, that has saved millions of lives. 
Is that God working to overcome the effects of the curse? That's just one of thousands of examples that we could give. And we can share his abundance with others, confident in the knowledge that he will continue to provide for those who love him. God never brings us to a point and says, okay, now you're on your own. He takes us by the hand and says, I'll guide you through it. I'll give you the freedom you want, but I'll be there. Just like when we're teaching a child how to walk, we don't just pick them up, set them on their feet, and then leave the room. Parents will walk behind them, will be there just in case they get wobbly and start to fall over so they don't bang their head against the table. (laughs) Until we're sure that they can keep their balance, that their muscles learn how to do that. When you're a parent trying to teach your child how to ride a two-wheel bicycle, you know, the scariest thing for a little kid is when those training wheels come off. How many of us have run alongside the kid with the bicycle, trying to keep up with them as they're getting the courage to pedal a little faster and a little faster, not worrying that they're going to suddenly tip over? And once they get it, man, that's it. They're gone. You never have to worry about that again. That's how God works with us. He's given us all that we need, even in a fallen world. But above all, we must share the message we have received in our own lives. That we can be redeemed from the curse through Jesus' gift of salvation to us. That's what's most important. Filling the bellies of those in need is important. And it has always been part of the mission of the church to care for the poor. But filling the souls of those who are lost is the most important task we have as stewards of God's creation. Because we want to see, as God certainly does, as many people as possible experiencing his perfect world when he creates a new heaven and a new earth for all who love him. That's the best way to be stewards of creation. That's the best way to celebrate. Bringing as many people into the kingdom as the Lord will allow So we don't have to hug a tree. We don't have to worship the planet. But we still sure can enjoy the green grass and the beautiful flowers and the beautiful sunset. And all the other blessings that God has put all around us. And if that leads people to know him personally, to accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, then so much the better. Because as we read before from Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this earth day. We thank you that we can be focused on your creation and all the amazing things you've put here for us to enjoy and celebrate. Forgive us, Lord, when we take our eyes off you, though, and look at things. Lord, we know that as amazing as this world is, it is fallen and broken. And that things do break down and wear out and rust and disease comes about from time to time. And certainly death affects all life. But Lord, we pray that you will help us to have the hope within us that Paul is talking about here. The hope that our redemption as sons and daughters of God will become complete one day when you return. And that you will set right this fallen universe and make it perfect forever. Lord, there are so many wonders you have planned for us that we can't even grasp at this point. But we hope for those things. We look forward to those things. And we trust in you to provide them. Help us to take this message of hope to those around us, to those who are afraid, to those who are lost, to those who are scared, sorrowful, depressed. Help us to give them the kind of hope 
that only you can provide. And we pray, our Father, that you'd be honored and glorified. Thank you for this day. And thank you for this calling that you've placed on our lives. <clears throat> and this hope that you've put within our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.